now. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I think we'll just wait a little moment for to have some of our other participants join us. Um, and um, now I think we'll be good to go. Okay, great. So good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Um, welcome, everybody, to this uh, webinar organized by the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate. And here we will be discussing agricultural policies in the Asia Pacific region, ensuring food security, livelihoods, and climate change mitigation. So my name is Ali Avery. I'm an ag agricultural economist at um, the Agri Food and Trade and Markets Division at the OECD Trade and uh, Agriculture Directorate. And it's my pleasure to be moderating this uh, webinar with you today. We're really keen to hear from you throughout this event. So for those of you connected via Zoom, please type your questions uh, into the chat and we'll do our best to answer those uh, during the Q&A session of the, at the end of this webinar. Um, so please also note that the webinar is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. For those of you who are watching uh, the YouTube live stream, please feel free to add your questions into the chat box. And again, we'll try to respond to those either in writing or during uh, the open uh, uh, question uh, session. Now we have a really full of, uh, agenda with an exciting lineup of speakers today. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to hand over to Martin von Lamp who is the head of the Agricultural Policies Monitoring and Evaluation Unit in the Agriculture Resource Policies Division at the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate. And he's gonna say a few words to open our meeting. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and hello everyone, um, excited to be here. And thanks for you to be here as well. Um, agriculture is facing multiple challenges. At the OECD, we speak of the triple challenge. On the one hand, the sector needs to assure food and nutrition security for a growing world population. On the other, it needs to provide for livelihoods for the millions involved in farming or in the wider food system. And all this needs to be reached in a sustainable manner without depleting natural resources and while uh, contributing to reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Governments around the world provide support to the sector to help it address the specific challenges faced. OECD has long been engaged in measuring and assessing the support provided to agriculture and its annual Agricultural Policy Monitoring and Evaluation Report now covers 54 countries representing three quarters of global agricultural value added. The agricultural support provided in these countries is significant, and we will hear more about this later today. And the question is whether the support provided to the sector is helping the sector to improve food security and livelihoods and to become more sustainable and climate friendly. When the OECD agricultural ministers met last November, they made a very strong call for action in order to improve food security and nutrition, ensure inclusive livelihoods, achieve sustainable productivity growth, and increase climate change mitigation efforts, among, among others. Climate change in particular is a major and complex issue for agriculture. First, food production is significantly affected by the changing climates, both through changes in average temperatures and precipitation patterns, rising sea levels, and increasing in severity of extreme weather events. Many of the countries in Southeast Asia and the Pacific are particularly affected, threatening food security and livelihoods in the region. Second, agriculture and land use changes themselves are responsible for a fifth of global emissions. And third, and importantly, the sector offers ample opportunity for reducing its own emission, as well as to sequester carbon 
from the atmosphere. This webinar looks at agricultural and mitigation policies around the world and in Asia Pacific region, and addresses the question of how these policies can help to ensure food security, improve livelihoods and reduce the sector's emissions and how they could be improved further. A number of recent reports have looked at these questions from different angles, both from a glo global and from a regional perspective, and we're fortunate to have speakers from the OECD, the Australian Bureau for Agricultural Resource Economics and Sciences, and the Asian Development Bank to present key research on this topic. Moreover, we have a panel with policymakers and experts from the region who will subsequently provide their perspectives on the challenges and ways to address them. All this should provide ample input into the open uh, discussion, which we hope to have at the end of this webinar. I really look forward to both presentations and the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Martin. So now I'm going to pass the floor over to my colleague, Jibran Punsaki, who's an agricultural economist in uh, the Agriculture and Resource Policies Division at the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate. Jibran will present for us an overview of the key findings from the latest uh, OECD Agricultural Policy Monitoring and Evaluation Report from last year, and which will include for the, in this report includes for the first time, the thematic focus on reforming agricultural policies for climate change mitigation. Jibran, over to you. Thanks, Ellie. So, Today I'll provide an overview of some of the key challenges related to climate action in agriculture and we'll discuss the main policy responses and reform priorities based on the conclusions from our flagship agricultural policy monitoring and evaluation report which was published in June last year and includes a thematic focus on climate change mitigation. So as mentioned by Martin agriculture faces a complex and unique challenge in the context of climate change. First, the sector is particularly vulnerable to climate change due to its dependency on weather and climatic conditions. It's already experiencing negative impacts from higher temperatures, increased variability of rainfall, invasive pests, and greater frequency of extreme weather events. Second, agriculture is a major source of global greenhouse gas emissions both directly through on-farm emissions linked to production and indirectly through land use change due to agricultural expansion. And third, unlike many other emission intensive sectors, agriculture also has the potential to contribute directly uh, positively to global efforts to mitigate climate change, both by reducing its direct and indirect emissions, as well as by sequestering carbon in biomass and soils. Now, this slide presents data from the latest IPCC report, which shows that the agriculture, forestry and other land use sector, or AFALU, its share in total global anthropogenic emissions reached 22% in 2019. And if we add the emissions from pre and post production processes, the total emissions from food systems are closer to one third of global emissions. Now, approximately half of AFALU's emissions, or 11% of global emissions, comes from direct on-farm emissions of non-CO2 gases, which are mainly methane and nitrous oxide. And the remaining 11% of global emissions comes from land use, land use change in forestry, or LULUCF, which mostly consists of CO2 emissions. And the latest assessment from the IPCC shows that there is significant potential for emissions reduction and carbon sequestration. And interestingly, the potential for reducing emissions, uh, direct emissions from agriculture is relatively limited, but the overall potential when various land use change options are included is greater than current emissions from the sector. The potential to reduce emissions through demand side measures is also not insignificant, uh, both through dietary changes to shift consumption to low emission food choices, and also reducing food losses and waste. 
So what are countries doing to reduce their emissions from agriculture? All of the 54 countries covered in our monitoring and evaluation report have submitted their nationally determined contributions or NDCs under the Paris Agreement. And most of these include targets to reach net zero emissions by 2050 or shortly thereafter. However, the number of long-term strategies submitted is lower and only 16 out of 54 countries or less than a third have set emission reduction targets for their agricultural sector which can be helpful to focus mitigation efforts and to measure progress. A significant number of countries also signed the Global Methane Pledge, which is an important signal, even though not directly linked to national emissions reduction commitments. Now, governments have a range of policy options at their disposal to reduce agricultural emissions. Putting a price on agricultural emissions is considered to be the most efficient way to encourage producers to reduce their emissions, either in the form of taxes or through emissions trading schemes. A few countries have taken steps towards implementing such instruments. However, non-CO2 agricultural emissions are generally not part of these schemes. Other examples of emissions pricing instruments include carbon offsets, which allow farmers to sell credits to the trading schemes, providing additional income generating opportunities, and abatement subsidies, such as Australia's Emissions Reduction Fund. And uh, when these are delivered through auctions, they can be effective measures as well, but are limited by budgetary resources available. Agricultural support grants or preferential credits can help to reduce emissions, but typically these do not have stringent emission measurement requirements and are likely to be less efficient than policies that set an explicit carbon price and use competitive market-based approaches to disperse funds. And then we have environmental regulations, which are widely used and can have positive effects on mitigation as well, even if they target other environmental issues such as pollution. Finally, investments in R&D, innovation and knowledge transfer are known to have large payoffs and can help to reduce emissions. However, the benefits of these tend to accrue over the long run and other measures are therefore needed to mitigate emissions in the shorter term. Now, our annual agricultural policy monitoring and evaluation report measures agricultural support across 54 countries and the latest numbers from this year's report show that governments provide 817 billion US dollars per year in support to the agricultural sector. So how much of this 817 billion dollars per year in support is helping to achieve climate change mitigation objectives? Well, most of the support, $611 billion per year, is provided directly to producers. The remainder is provided in the form of general services, which includes investments in R&D, innovation, infrastructure and biosecurity, and support to consumers. Now, zooming in on the producer support, we see that $391 billion per year is market distorting and potentially harmful to long-term efforts to combat climate change and other food systems challenges. This includes price incentives, what we call market price support, payments based on output and payments based on the use of variable inputs when provided without constraints. Then we have some $216 billion per year, which is provided in a less distorted format. That is, they are measures that are less coupled to production and to greenhouse gas emissions. And only $2 billion per year is provided in non-distorting support to producers, such as payments for ecosystem services. So we can see from this chart that support to producers measured relative to gross farm receipts varies substantially across countries. It also varies significantly across the Asia Pacific region, and these countries are highlighted in yellow. So we see that in some countries, such as Vietnam and India, support is actually negative, meaning that producers are effectively subject to implicit taxation. Australia and New Zealand provide very low levels of support to their agricultural sectors and policy settings are characterised by a strong emphasis on market openness. 
In China and Indonesia, support to producers is comparable to the average across OECD member countries. However, as these economies have been growing at a fast pace, we see that support has increased over the past two decades. We see a similar story in the Philippines where support is slightly higher than the OECD average. And then finally in Japan and Korea, producer support accounts for over 40% of gross farm receipts. However, unlike China, India, China, Indonesia and the Philippines, the support has been trending downward and has decreased over the past two decades. Now, unfortunately, a significant part of agricultural support is not helping to achieve climate change mitigation objectives. So our latest assessment shows that $361 billion per year is transferred to producers of specific commodities, creating incentives for increased production and greenhouse gas emissions. $76 billion per year is transferred to producers of beef and veal, sheep, meat and rice, all of which are products with high emission intensities. And we can see in this chart how commodity specific support varies across countries and how it's split between different categories of products, including livestock products, grains, vegetable oils and sugar, and fruits and vegetables. Another form of support with significant potential to increase emissions is provided for the, the use of variable inputs such as fertilizers, fuel or irrigation. And this doesn't appear on this chart, but amounts to an additional $60 billion per year. Investments in innovation, biosecurity and infrastructure can help to foster sustainable productivity growth, which is a key driver for combating climate change and addressing other food systems challenges. Here again, we see that expenditure on innovation systems and on other key services vary significantly across Asia Pacific countries. Across all 54 countries, their share in public support to the sector has decreased from 16% two decades ago to 13% in our latest assessment. We also find that growth in R&D and innovation expenditures has slowed significantly, and it will be crucial to reverse this trend and to increase the share of R&D expenditures in support of climate change mitigation. So to conclude, we have identified six key policy actions which will be needed for agriculture to achieve both food systems and climate objectives. Phasing out market price support and payments with strong potential to harm the environment and distort markets and trade. Reorienting budgetary support to the provision of public goods and key general services. Targeting income support to households most in need. And then implementing an effective pricing system for agricultural greenhouse gas emissions to incentivize the transition to low emission agriculture. Developing a package of supply and demand side approaches to reduce emissions in agriculture. And finally, enhancing the resilience toolkit for a world of diverse risks, including increasing extreme weather events and natural disasters. So thank you very much. And please check out our website to have a look at our latest report. Thanks so much, Jubran. So I'm sure as a result of that uh, presentation, many of you will have some questions, but with our agenda being so full today, we'd ask that you would type those questions um, into the chat and we'll get to them during the discussion part of this at the towards the end of this webinar. So now I'm going to hand over uh, to James Fell, the Director and Program uh, Lead for Trade and Global uh, Change in the Australian Bureau for, of Agriculture and Resource Economics and Science, ABS, and um, to uh, Kevin Burns, an economist for Trade and uh, Global Change at ABS as well. And both um, James and Kevin will present the key findings from the ABS Insights Report on emissions, agricultural support, and uh, food security. Over to you, James and Kevin, thanks. Thank you, Jibran, for operating the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation for us. And thank you, Delegate Secretariat and attendees. My name is James Fell, and I'll be, uh, along with my colleague Kevin Burns today, I'll be providing a very brief overview 
of some recent research that Kevin Burns, Dr. Alway Chow and Dr. Jared Greenville undertook. And the research acknowledges the policy objectives in agriculture and it considers what steps governments can take to achieve all of them. Now, I must pass on an apology from Dr. Jared Greenville, our executive director, who does wish he could be here with you all today. Um, next slide, please. So we'll just start with some facts. Um, we just heard some figures from, from Gibran as well. Um, so it's clear that over time, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and related land use have been increasing. So the chart on the left there, that shows the very large role the livestock emissions play in this. Um, and of course, this is just um, a much more kind of direct metric. If we include the, the broader definition as Jibran did in the previous presentation, you know, the numbers are even higher up around 12 gigatons, and then you can expand it even higher if you use food as well. But it's important also to acknowledge here um, the strong link between land use and emissions. So onto our, our second key fact. We know from OECD research that support um, to um, all areas of agriculture been, has been increasing over time, and other sources also confirm statistics of a similar nature. Now, we know that the value of distortions in global agriculture has been rising, but it's also important for policy analysts and researchers to understand what are the drivers, I guess, behind um, um, such observations, what, what, and, and what are policymakers' intentions and motivations? Um, next slide, please. So this brings us to the policy objectives or some policy objectives in agriculture. Now, every country will be different, but broadly speaking, we could uh, class policies into these three categories of reducing emissions, improving or maintaining food security, and achieving or improving economic well-being um, of all or some sections of society. Now, it appears that emissions go up when support goes up, but what about food security? Is there an inverse relationship between food security and support? Likewise, uh, for economic well-being. So we asked this question, and we considered a specific uh, scenario, a specific situation, which incorporates expansion in agricultural land use, but fixed constraints on that expansion. So this is a specific question. Um, these fixed constraints on that expansion, um, that, that's similar to agreements that might curb the expansion of land use or deforestation. Now, given the seriousness of the global climate situation, it's important for us to consider all potential avenues for reducing emissions. Um, I might now hand over to my colleague, Kevin Burns, and Jibran, if you can push to the next slide, please, that would be much appreciated. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, so Jibran has provided a great overview of the types of uh, support currently provided to agriculture. So uh, when we're talking about support, we're talking about two main categories, especially for our modeling. Uh, direct farm support, which is uh, essentially farm subsidies, and trade barriers, which is market price support uh, that Jibran mentioned, so things like tariffs. Um, and as Jibran said, the value of agricultural support paid directly to producers is um, above $600 billion uh, in, the, in the most recent MER report, um, and that's been uh, increasing since the, the last period. It's about 13% above the previous period. Um, and average uh, support now exceeds 13% of the value of agricultural production, which is substantially above what it was two decades ago. Uh, one important thing to consider when we're, we're talking about the, the Paris Agreement and the, the trajectory of, of agriculture to 2050 is that the, the value of this support is going to, to continue to increase unless reform occurs. Uh, because support is, is currently linked to agricultural production, which is going to grow over time. Um, so the links between support and environmental outcomes um, are multiple. So we've, we've got a picture here which shows that basically um, uh, support can distort farmer decisions in terms of what they want to produce 
um, away from the market efficient outcome towards uh, a, a more supported outcome um, and how much they, they want to produce as well. So it can lead to excessive production in some cases. Um, often because uh, commodities are targeted by support, this can lead to higher output of emission intensive products like livestock, which is what Jibrin showed in his data as well. Um, support can also distort farmers' decisions on how to produce um, their products, um, which is can either, either be directly by subsidising uh, farm specific farm inputs, and also indirectly by just changing the the way that farmers approach risk um, and innovation, um, which can affect long term uh, productivity growth uh, in agriculture. Um, and finally, um, support also affects um, where commodities are produced by uh, focusing production in supported regions um, and preventing production from moving to more efficient and potentially less emission intensive regions in the, in the world. Uh, so next slide, please, Jibran. Um, so, but the, the link between theory and, and, and emissions is ambiguous. Um, it is possible that support uh, if, if uh, carefully targeted, could actually um, reduce emissions in some cases. So um, reforming support may um, increase or decrease greenhouse gas emissions, depending on where production moves and what is produced. Um, so in order to, to look at the effects of current support levels, um, we need to do some sort of empirical analysis um, and uh, under, understand how, how you know, support affects those, that triple challenge that um, uh, was discussed uh, uh, earlier. So the, the effect of, of, um, of agriculture's contribution to welfare, to, to emissions and to food security. Um, so Aves has done this uh, empirical analysis using our um, uh, computable general equilibrium model, GTAM, the Global Trade and Environment Model. Uh, and we looked at three different scenarios. Uh, first of all, we removed um, producer subsidies uh, on agriculture only. Secondly, we removed uh, tariff barriers on agriculture and on food production. And thirdly, we uh, combined those two reforms. Um, and we examined the results in terms of both their impacts on incomes and food security, as well as on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I should note here also that part of our analysis, we did restrict uh, the amount of agricultural land, uh, amount of land moving into agriculture. So we, we effectively uh, prevented uh, further deforestation from occurring in, in agriculture. That's because we want to examine whether feeding the world was possible with, with current land constraints. Um, and if by reforming support, uh, we could uh, achieve gains in agricultural productivity uh, that um, means that uh, further, further land wouldn't be needed to, to feed the world. So the results are, are in the graph on the right hand side. Um, we found that if subsidies are removed by themselves, world income, which is the blue column, which is very small in this, um, does rise slightly and agricultural emissions fall by quite, by quite a bit, more than 1%. Um, but the consumption of both meat and other food products also declines because uh, removal of subsidies actually increases food prices um, and, and this uh, affects especially the, the, uh, the, the poorest uh, across the globe. Um, so, so whilst subsidy reform could be beneficial for the environment, it could hurt harm some social outcomes. Uh, now the second um, scenario, we removed trade barriers and left subsidies intact. Uh, and this led to a, a large expansion in food production and um, and consumption, so it was good for food security, but it also led to some increase in greenhouse gas emissions. The, the emission impact was quite small because there were efficiency gains that were unlocked, but um, the, uh, the, the, there is nevertheless a rise in emissions. Um, we should note here that um, it's difficult to implement this policy in, real, in the real world because uh, subsidies remain and subsidies do require, do impose a large budgetary burden. So uh, that's hard to achieve without uh, without some tariff revenue. Um, and on the right hand side, we show that the sweet spot is if we can undertake um, comprehensive reform of both subsidies and uh, uh, trade barriers. So that raises both income and food consumption, um, as well as economic growth. 
while reducing uh, agricultural and economy-wide emissions. Um, the results highlight that pursuing partial reform can actually have negative outcomes um, and that uh, a comprehensive reform is, is, is what is needed uh, if we are to, uh, to, uh, to achieve the triple challenge. So next slide, please, Jim. So there's widespread benefits from uh, pursuing broad-based reform. Um, when done right, support can improve economic growth, food security, household welfare, and reduce emissions. There are some limitations to our analysis, which I'll just mention briefly because we're running out of time. Um, we don't include climate change impacts and climate change is potentially going to have a large effect on, on agricultural productivity and the compar comparative advantage of different countries around the world. Uh, we also, like I, like I mentioned, didn't include deforestation. We assumed that, um, that regulations were in place to restrict it. But if that weren't the case, then there could be a lot of, uh, there could be quite sizable um, perverse outcomes from some of the expansion of agricultural production. Um, and lastly, uh, like has been mentioned before, it's imperative to, to explore all avenues of emissions reductions. These reductions that we found here were, were above 1%, but still quite small in the context of the Paris Agreement. Uh, but they, they are good interim um, uh, improvements that could be achieved while waiting for technology advancements to occur. So uh, I think I'll, I'll finish there. Um, thanks very much for your time. Um, Jibrin, if you just want to jump to the next slide, I think I'll um, just thank everybody um, for the time. And thank you, Kevin, as well. And I, I guess a, a key thing that we looked at there was the importance of food, not just agriculture, but also food. Um, so thanks for your time. And um, the last few days, I'll also just take the opportunity to wish you all Happy Lunar New Year, which is an important festival in uh, many parts of this region. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, James and Kevin, some really interesting findings there. And um, I see that there's already a question in the chat that we'll get to uh, later on uh, and answer and pose to you. Um, so now we'll move on to, to the third pr uh, presentation of the third report and uh, from the Asian Development Bank. And uh, Dr. Uh, Dil uh, Rahut is uh, the Vice Chair of the re uh, Research and Senior Research Fellow at the Asian Development Bank uh, Institute. And he's uh, presenting to us from uh, Tokyo, based in Tokyo. and. Um, uh, so Dill will uh, present the recent, uh, recently released um, Asian Development Bank report on climate change mitigation policies and lessons for Asia. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ilya. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you, Zevran. And, and thanks to OECD for organizing this very important uh, uh, webinar. I think uh, it's very timely and it's very, very important uh, uh, issues that we're going to deal with. So let me share my PPT. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about climate change mitigations policy and lessons from Asia. So this is uh, from our book that was recently published. So I have like uh, five sections, uh, uh, the introductions, the role of agriculture in Asia, mitigation strategies in air flu sectors, potential adverse impact of those uh, mitigation strategies and concluding remarks. I just like, you know, like uh, based on what uh, other speaker has already pointed out, agriculture is both victim as well as perpetrators of climate change, yet it has potential to play a critical role in the fight against climate change. So that's something that, that we should take a note uh, before we start. Uh, GHG emissions from human activities, we have seen that it has increased significantly. As a result, you know, we have seen the increase in intensity as well as frequency of climate shocks. We have seen, seen heat waves, we have seen floods in Pakistan in recent years. So there is an urgent need to act to reduce GHG, uh, to reduce GHG emissions and achieve net zero carbon emission as soon as possible. And uh, in this light to may achieve net zero carbon emissions, all Asian countries have made a very significant commitment. Agriculture is directly responsible 
uh, uh, is directly dependent on weather conditions. Hence, it's very vulnerable to climate shock. Okay? Like, you know, it's the hardest hit uh, sectors, I think, without effort to adapt and mitigate climate change at 1.5 degree and 2 degree food security risks due to climate change will be catastrophic. So, so we have no options but to go ahead with uh, climate change mitigation strategies. It could lead to malnutrition, micronutrient deficiency uh, in low and middle income countries. Additionally, 20 to 36% uh, may face hunger in 2050 under high emission scenario and 11 to 13% under low emission scenario, which means that we are, you know, I mean, like even if we go for for uh, net zero carbon emissions, we are going to face the tragic uh, threat to these uh, food sec and nutritional securities. Okay. Now, additionally, 65 million people will experience food insecurity due to climate change impact in 2030, and it will reduce average energy intake by 20 in 2050 by five percent. Land requirement would uh, increase from an initial 1.5 billion hectare to 1.7 billion. So SDG targets are therefore not met even by 2050. If uh, if anything, food security is Detroit. So uh, so I, I just wanted to highlight how uh, how challenging our future is. So 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 we really need to act very quickly. And if uh, just, I just want to show GHG uh, GHG emissions by sectors in in Asia, you can see like. Uh, like airflow sectors contribute to almost 34 uh, percent in Asia, and uh, and from other sectors uh, like you know we have energy sectors that's contributing more most to GHG emissions, and and almost Asia contributes to about 44.9 percent of the GHG emissions. And here, if you look at it, airflow sector contributes to about 16.5 percent of the GHG emissions. Now, now these charts here. I wanted to show the 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 GAG emissions from different uh, farm gates, forest land, and land use. You can see it's mostly coming from farm gates, and uh, and and below is uh, is forest land is basically carbon sink, and then land use sink also uh, land use changes. Also, you can see the the, the GAG emissions, and uh, in Asia. Most of the GAG emissions is coming from enteric fermentations, 26%. And as you know, like uh, Asia is rice consuming country. So it, uh, in, uh, it, uh, it contributes to about 16% from rice and uh, drain organic soil contributes to about 12%, uh, fires in organic soil 10%, and synthetic fertilizers about 8%. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, just to show you here, if you look at at this chart, you can see that uh, that uh, Indonesia actually has the highest emissions from uh, flu sectors uh, in thousand kilowatts, and uh, and it's mostly coming from land use change because of palm oil contributions. And China and India are second largest, but it's mostly coming from farm gates, not much from land use change. And these are actually like I've taken the the most uh, most agriculture uh, uh, dependent. And then importance of agriculture. You see that agriculture is very, very important for Asia. It uh, like uh, like it it emits about. Uh, if you look at uh, contributions to GDP worldwide, is 4.3, but in Asia it's about 7.7. So agriculture is very, very important. And uh, I and also I have shown the in constant price. It co contributes to about about 2.4 billion. That's quite uh, significant. And it. Also, form a very important source of export. Uh, you can see so, and in terms of employment, also agriculture employs employs uh, close to about half a billion people. So, agriculture is very, very important for Asia. And basically, I've taken only those ten, uh, you know, highly, uh, highly, uh, like highly emi uh, GAG emitting countries in agriculture sectors. And in terms of nutrition and poverty, you can see that Asia has very significant amount of uh, number of people below poverty, a significant number of uh, people who are undernourished. You can see 387 million people are undernourished and almost like uh, you can see 430, 50% of uh, food secure people live in Asia. Moderate to like severe food security is one point. Uh, 1.1 billion. So imagine if we don't do anything to fight climate change, where we are heading towards. 
so I'll just highlight some of the GAG mitigation strategies that we have uh, in Asia. Like uh, there's one on the demand side and one on the supply side, as the previous panelists have pointed out. So if, if you look at like one is the dietary changes, like consuming low carbon footprint uh, food, like uh, less meats, more fruits and vegetable and growing locally. But uh, you should know that uh, dietary change is an individual decision and uh, we it cannot be forced. And second is that it doesn't happen in one generation. It can take uh, you know, a number of years, maybe four or five decades for a dietary change to happen. Like for example, I'm from Asia, I've moved to different countries, but even then my dietary uh, pattern has not changed. And the other important source of reducing uh, uh, GHG emissions is reducing food waste and food loss. By reducing food waste and food loss, we can, uh, we, uh, you know, close to like, we can, uh, we can feed almost like entire Africa uh, for a year. So which means that uh, reducing food loss and food, uh, uh, food waste uh, could significantly contribute to GAG mitigations and food security. And uh, the, the other important strategies that we have is sustainable intensification. We have this project from CIMIT in, in South Asia, uh, covering endogenetic plants, uh, where we are, we are trying to go for sustainable intensifications, like trying to produce more with less inputs and improving nitrogen fixations. Uh, so uh, like nitrogen management, that's one of the important strategies that we have in hand. And also like enteric uh, fermentation management, increasing like, you know, like if you look at Mongolia, you know, you have like uh, almost like uh, 70 million livestock. So rather than having more livestock, you reduce the number of livestock, have high yielding varieties, you know, and also manage the, 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 the fodders uh, so that you don't pollute. And then uh, carbon sequestration in agriculture sectors, uh, uh, like agroforestry can also contribute uh, significantly. And this has been taking place in a great scale in in Asia, like no tillage, uh, cultivating, uh, like going for agroforestry. Uh, and then and, uh, the other one is uh, reducing emissions from rice cultivations, alternate uh, wetting and drying is one of the suggested uh, methods that has been largely practiced in Asia now. And then fuel use, like as, as one of our panelists has pointed out, like going for clean fuel, reducing fuel subsidy, reducing subsidies in, 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 in fertilizers could help. And also land use change and managing pet lens is another way to, way to reduce the uh, uh, thing. But there are challenges, you know, the challenge is that, uh, that this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, although we have uh, this technology in place, but scaling this technology has been very challenging. I found the technology uptake is very, very less. So that's one challenge that, that, uh, that we are facing. Not only that, some of the, most of the technology that we adopted, we don't realize the maladaptation. So, so over a period of time, we tend to realize that some of the technology that we adopted uh, had, uh, had created greater damage than, than benefits. So I don't want to go through this detail. So, so, so moving forward is that, uh, that, uh, that we have to, like you have no options, but to go with, uh, with, with GAG mitigation strategies in agriculture sector, even though it's going to impact the productions adversely in the short run. So, so we really need to trade the part very carefully so that we don't disrupt the, the food security situations on one hand, but at the same time, we reduce uh, GAG, mitig uh, GAG emissions significantly. So, so we really need to balance this out. With this, I'd like to conclude my presentations. Thank you very much. Yeah, floor. Great, thank you. Hey, um, thank you so much, Dil. That was really interesting, and particularly uh, your emphasis on on the challenges and. Uh, the adoption of technology also changing uh, the way people consume. And you made the comment that you're um, that you've moved several times in your lifetime, and it's taken you some a time to change your diet. And I'm from New Zealand, and I'm enjoying living in Paris, and have changed my diet to enjoy all good French food. So thank you very much. So um, now we have uh, interventions. Happily, we have interventions from five uh, experts from the Asia Pacific uh, countries, and they're going to share their views on the topic. Um, each uh, of our experts will, will speak for about five minutes. And uh, firstly, uh, we will hear from uh, uh, Lev uh, Nico uh, Makalintel, 
who is the development uh, management officer from the macroeconomic uh, policy division of the policy research service of the Department of Agriculture from the Philippines. Um, Lev, over to you, please, for five minutes. Thank you. Yes, uh, good morning, Ellie. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me loud and clear? Okay. Okay, uh, once again, uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers, the OECD, and uh, uh, to our uh, presenters. Uh, 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 a while ago, James, Kevin, and um, uh, Dr. Rahut uh, for 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 uh, those uh, wonderful presentations. Um, uh, actually, uh, upon hearing these presentations, it it, it really um, highlighted uh, the 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 need uh, for not only for the for the developing countries and developed countries. Uh, individually to, to, to do action, but to do it collectively, especially in, in, um, in addressing climate change, not only uh, to adapt to the impacts of climate change, but to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, just to give a background uh, in the Philippines, um, the Philippines is a, um, based on the World Risk Index, uh, uh, ranks number one in terms of vulnerability to climate change impacts. Um, and uh, ironically, uh, the, the Philippines has only contributed 0.48% of GHG uh, emissions. So looking at uh, our contribution to this uh, global impact and the effects of uh, this, uh, this uh, problem to our, our country, not only uh, in the agriculture sector, but the country as a whole is, uh, we can see there's a really big, uh, uh, what they call this, um, allow me to be candid. It, it's a, a big injustice to our, to our, to our uh, country. But of course, but of course, uh, we, uh, we are one with the call uh, for, for looking at alternative ways of doing things. Like uh, the Philippines is now focusing on um, having a sustainable development pathway, especially in the agriculture sector. As we all know, the, uh, the agriculture sector in the Philippines uh, well contributes uh, about 20% of the total emissions of the 0.48%. I'd like to emphasize the 0.48%. But ag the agriculture, agriculture sector contributes 20% of uh, that uh, emission. And unfortunately, uh, bulk of the of the of the uh, well of the industries and uh, sectors that are uh, that are working at that in the agriculture sector are the most marginalized sector in the Philippines. So the farmers and the fishers are the poorest uh, members of the society. So right now, what we're trying to do is to really help them boost uh, their adaptive capacity through through. Uh, through promoting interventions and policies and interventions in that increasing the natural local capacities of, of, uh, of the communities at the ground. The problem is we need to upscale these uh, good practices, the best practices, because climate change uh, in the Philippines, our priority is climate change adaptation, but with mitigation called benefit, because we all know that uh, we have to do our also we have to uh, give our fair share to, to, to curbing these greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so what we're trying to do is to empower these uh, small communities, the farmers and fisher folk. We would like to make them uh, to, 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 to cluster them, to, to make them organized, to make them an enterprise so that they can they can have uh, a potential to, to really um, well, to have to increase their adaptive capacity through increasing income, um, and even even have these economies of scale. But of course, we would like to shift from the traditional way of uh, of doing uh, or production systems into a much more sustainable. That's why we're sustainable uh, to a much more sustainable manner, where wherein we are introducing uh, clean. Um, clean, um, uh, renewable energy uh, uh, technologies, 
and then uh, also um, organic agriculture practices. But of course, these are in the context of ensuring food security. We all know that uh, given the, the impacts of climate change and the vulnerability of the sector, especially during uh, the COVID pandemic, and even the, this, uh, 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 what's happening in uh, Russia and Ukraine, we can see that the the the, the sector is very vulnerable, and the, and to ensure food security in the Philippines is the number one priority. And to do this, based on our uh, nationally determined contribution, we we um, we would like to transition into a, a cleaner uh, and greener or bluer agriculture and fisheries sector through uh, collaboration and finance, external finance coming from, coming from uh, 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 international organizations or development partners. Because uh, although, although based on the presentation we have, uh, I don't know if it's James or Kevin who cited that we have uh, uh, budget support, budgetary support for agriculture sector, but these are for survival, I think. Uh, uh, these are for survival of the, the sector itself and the survival of the people uh, 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 doing, doing agriculture uh, in the Philippines. And this is not enough. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this is not enough. But we are doing uh, our best and we are doing everything to partner with everyone to, to, really, um, to really achieve the twin goal of uh, improving food security and, uh, well, uh, providing a, uh, a better uh, environment for the future generation of Philippi not only Filipinos, but of course, of uh, all the people in the world. So I think um, I, I, I limit my, uh, my response to, to those uh, key points. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lev, for those um, interesting insights, particularly talking about your emissions profile, um, the significance of the agriculture sector to the emissions profile in the Philippines, and the need for um, the adoption of new technologies in order for farmers to do uh, produce more, more efficiently uh, with less uh, emissions. Um, so very interesting insights. Thank you very much, and really nice sticking to the time. Um, thanks so much. So now we'll pass over um, to Shikufu, uh, Fumi um, Shikushi, who is the Deputy Director of International Strategy Division, Export and International Affairs Bureau of the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries from Japan. Mr. Kikuchi, uh, the floor is yours for an intervention of five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. I thank the OECD for giving me this opportunity today, and uh, time is limited and moving forward. So our common challenge is how to achieve the sustainability and uh, productivity growth at the same time. And uh, Japan believes that uh, promos promoting the innovation is a key solution. And in 2021, Japan formulated uh, the strategy for sustainable food systems called Midori Strategy, based on dialogue with uh, various domestic stakeholders. And this is a strategy to promote uh, both productivity growth and uh, sustainability through innovation. And it has ambitious numerical targets, including zero CO2 emission from the agriculture, forestry, and fishery sectors by 2050, 30% reduction of chemical fertilizers used by 2050, and 50% reduction of food growth and waste by 2030. Uh, based on this strategy, we are working on the development and dissemination of various new technologies which includes the measures explained by the ADBI before. And last year, a new registration entered into force to support farmers and the business, businesses uh, working for the food system transformation. And I would like to mention some points that we believe are important in building sustainable agriculture and food systems. Uh, first one is that uh, there is no one-size-fits-all solution for building sustainable food system. 
Uh, this is emphasized in the UN Food System Summit in 2021. Um, it is necessary to take approaches customized to climate and natural condition, form of agriculture, and dietary patterns of each country and region. Um, Asian countries and Japan have many commonalities such as hot and humid climate and paddy field agriculture, which required different approaches from other region. And Japan's military strategy was developed and an um, initiative for sustainable food system in the Asian monsoon region. Uh, based on this strategy, Japan is working with uh, ASEAN countries to establish and disseminate technologies that can be shared in ASEAN region, such as uh, adaptation of alternative wetting and drying uh, water control for methane emission, emission reduction. And second point is the uh, promotion of innovation, as I said earlier, but uh, it, should, it should not be uh, considered only as a development of new technologies. All forms of innovation, including new collaboration and combination, are necessary. Um, in addition, the fruits of innovation should be effectively utilized by a wide range of small uh, stakeholders, uh, including small scale farmers. So it is important to strengthen the cooperation and the engagement with uh, various stakeholders. Uh, in Japan, the public private roundtable was established in 2021 to facilitate further collaboration with various stakeholders for sustainable food system. In addition, uh, investments from the private sector in innovation and R&D must be promoted. Um, thirdly, uh, I would like to uh, point out the importance of the repurpose and reorient agriculture policies and uh, increasing the positive incentives. Uh, incentives, uh, including subsidy that has a negative impact on environment, need to be phased out or reformed as uh, Avaris explained. But however, uh, some studies, uh, including FAO and uh, World Bank, reported that uh, simple elimination or reduction of incentives could lead to the uh, various trade-offs such as the decline in the agricultural production, increase in the food price, or decline in the farmer's income. Um, it could have have negative, negative impact on the achievement of the SDGs. Uh, for this reason, uh, it is important to convert or to reconfigure existing environmental harms or incentives into the opposite ones, positive ones. Uh, such as support for R&D and innovation and support for the environmentally friendly practice, practices uh, take into account uh, national circumstances. The declaration of the OECD Agricultural Minister's meeting last November also emphasized the, this point, the importance of the effort to reform or reorient the agriculture policy. Uh, lastly, uh, countries in the Pacific, Asia Pacific region should promote various forms of the collaboration and the cooperation and share best practice uh, suitable for this region. Uh, Japan intends to further contribute to the uh, building sustainable food system and uh, food security in this region with uh, cooperation with other countries and uh, OECD and uh, ADB. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, for that intervention. Um, I really um, enjoyed hearing um, about the emphasis on investment, uh, on new technologies, but also on cooperation and working with other, um, other countries in the Asia Pacific region. And I know that uh, Japan is very involved uh, in that, uh, in those activities. Um, and uh, also to hear um, from you about uh, uh, the repurposing of, of uh, negative um, support, which results in negative uh, environmental consequences, um, but moving that support towards uh, supporting positive environmental outcomes. And which, as you mentioned, was uh, part of what the ministers may, uh, said in their declaration from the agriculture ministers, um, agriculture ministers, OECD ministers who met and just in November last year. 
So it's great to hear all those um, insights from you. Thank you very much. Um, now we turn um, to um, Mr. Ta uh, Talim um, Sudari Auto um, from uh, Indonesia. Uh, uh, he is uh, a senior agricultural economist at the National Research and uh, Innovation Agency. Uh, and um, Mr. Uh, Sudari Alto, please over to you and to, uh, to share your uh, perspective on the topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Thank you also for this um, opportunity. I just uh, would like to uh, underline some of the points that's um, actually already uh, written in the report and also presented by uh, Gibran uh, earlier. First, just to provide the background, the uh, agricultural sector uh, in Indonesia contribute to 18% of uh, emissions uh, for the air pollu. And um, about 39% of these emissions coming from the uh, rice sector, that's the uh, most important sector for food security in, in Indonesia. And uh, with that then, the uh, according to um, technical scientists, some of the major impact of climate change, uh, there are uh, five uh, points. First, uh, rising, rising night temperature which lead to high respir respiration rate. And the second one is uh, increased space and disease outbreak. The third, more frequent and higher intensity of uh, natural disaster, particularly flood and drought. And the fourth one is uh, land degradation, land degradation, which uh, sometimes also end up with uh, harvest spillers and uh, finally loss of production. And the last, uh, particularly in the coastal regions, which is also the rice, rice producing uh, center, there is increased salinity and also increased um, flooded, flooded area. Okay, so with that, then uh, what's the government policy framework and actions uh, program uh, so far? First, uh, Indonesia uh, has submitted, of course, a long-term strategy for low carbon uh, and climate resilient uh, to OPT, which uh, aim to contribute to global goal and to achieve national development objectives at the same time, taking into con consideration the balance between emission reductions, economic growth, including food security, of course, in it, justice and climate resilience. Uh, development. And, uh, and more specifically, uh, it's also incorporated in the National Midterm Development Plan uh, 2020 to 2024, uh, which incorporates uh, uh, climate uh, uh, change mitigation and adaptation measures, emphasizing climate resilient and low carbon uh, uh, development. And uh, even more specifically, the climate change strategy of the agricultural sector include uh, mitigations and adaptations for increased resilience through climate smart agriculture. It aims to achieve subsufficiency and farmers welfare, of course, while considering the value of reducing carbon uh, em emissions. Uh, moving next to the uh, R&D, are a certain R&D and extension program focus on uh, climate smart practices and technologies, which include first development of plan varieties that resistant to climate stress and plan plan press and disease, and the second one uh, development of a planting calendar adjustment system that takes climate change into into account. And the third one, development of water balance modeling and plant nutrition on agricultural land and a geographic information system for distribution points of nutrients and water. And the fourth one, uh, development of efficient agricultural equipment and machinery for agricultural production process. Uh, lastly, what I see uh, still, you know, some 
more homework uh, for uh, future policy uh, policy uh, policy thing is the first one of course this is the long standing issues on fertilizer subsidy government spend more than uh, 30 trillion rupiah per 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 year so the pass out of fertilizer pile fertilizer policy fertilizer subsidies to reduce the applications of synthetic fertilizer which uh, contribute to the emissions uh, significantly and uh, the second one has to do with the strategy on um, rnd agriculture rnd uh, policy so if we uh, look back to the data on 2015 until 2020 the last 5 to 10 years share of rnd budget about 50 percent allocated to uh, increasing productivity of a food crop particularly rice you know because again driven by food security and food self-sufficiency uh, objective whereas the budget are any budget allocation for climate change only accounted for 2.4 percent and uh, also related to that for uh, allocated budget allocated for sustainability issues only for 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 nine percent so in at the same time i think overall budget of uh, agriculture are in indonesia only accounted for one point or zero one thirty five percent to agriculture GDP. So I think uh, uh, there is some estimate that uh, toward two thousand thirty, if we can increase the agriculture uh, R&D budget up to point five percent to agriculture GDP, that could be you know a significant significant move. I think that's uh, all I can say at, at this point. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you very much for those insights from Indonesia. <clears throat> and particularly uh, with regards to financing of uh, research and development and what, uh, what topics or what uh, sectors are receiving most uh, of most of the money. That's a very interesting insight for our monitoring team. And um, also your comment about uh, the use of the subsidization of fertilizers. Of course, fertilizers is getting a lot of attention globally at the moment with uh, increasing uh, prices of fertilizer um, and supply constraints. So that's very interesting. With also uh, your commentary about the uh, need for resilience and climate smart agriculture because of the impacts of uh, the natural disasters. So thank you very much for those uh, insights into Indonesia uh, climate adaptation and mitigation. So next, um, <clears throat> we have Hakyu Jong from, uh, who is the research uh, director from the Department of uh, Environment, research, uh, Resource and Research from the Philippines, oh, sorry, from Korea Rural uh, Economic Institute. Um, be great to hear from you, uh, the Korean perspective. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, today is uh, another era, uh, early every, and thank you very much for uh, your all speakers uh, for your amazing and interesting uh, presentations. Uh, as Dr. Dear Laut gave on a presentation about Asian countries agriculture. Uh, so uh, there are many uh, challenging issues in accomplishing uh, the uh, mitigation uh, target. Uh, first, if farmers adopt low carbon agricultural technologies, they will face a decrease uh, in yields of crops. Furthermore, if farmers adopt uh, those technologies, they will uh, also face an increase in production costs. Uh, second, the farmers do not recognize carbon neutral targets and agriculture as a source of greenhouse gas emissions. Well, a survey of farmers 
showed that only 40% recognized agriculture as the source of greenhouse emissions. Because of these issues, they do not want to adopt those technologies. In response to uh, these issues, our government, Korean government, announced strategies for promoting carbon neutrality for agricultural products in 2021. Now, I would like to uh, share climate change mitigation policy in the Korean agricultural sector with you. First, our government announced a reduction roadmap for 2050 carbon neutrality. Uh, we must reduce 5.9 billion tons of CO2 equivalent by 2030 and 8.2 million tons of CO2 equivalent reduction by 2050 in agricultural and livestock industries through diverse reduction instruments. Second, our government has three kinds of low carbon uh, agricultural uh, support program. The voluntary greenhouse gas emission, uh, the voluntary greenhouse gas reduction project, and the external business of uh, emission trading system are supporting farmers to adopt low carbon agricultural technology. Uh, let me explain about the external business. If farmers reduce greenhouse gas emissions, they can acquire a certificate and trade in the emission trading market. Then they can get a new income and obligatory companies can achieve their reduction target. And the certification system for low carbon agricultural and livestock products is supporting consumers who buy the product. Third, our government is considering direct payment for low carbon agriculture in connection with the optional public uh, purpose direct payment program to encourage the adoption of technology by farms. The range of unit price is calculated as follows. Minimum unit price is calculated as an additional cost and the maximum unit price is calculated as an additional cost plus environmental benefit. Fourth, our government is developing uh, cost-effective technologies. Uh, for example, energy sectors, example, uh, support for energy efficiency, improvement of agricultural machinery. Uh, fifth, our government is now uh, establishing a center in response to climate change in the agricultural sector. Uh, it will pro provide information uh, on the meaning and the impact of the carbon neutral de declaration to form a consensus. It will also provide the policy and the technical information through publicity and education. The center includes an integrated data management platform related to climate change response, adaptation, and mitigation. In the domestic agricultural sector, the platform will provide comprehensive information on adaptation to climate change and greenhouse gas reduction. I think that the 2050 carbon uh, neutral goal in the Korean agricultural sector gives us both uh, critical factors and opportunity factors at the same time. Uh, so I think that we must minimize the impact of critical factors and maximize the impact of opportunity factors through proper policy. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for that intervention and the insight to the policy mechanisms being used in Korea particularly uh, this um, uh, approach of direct payments for uh, low carbon agriculture. And um, from what I understand also the uh, use of labeling so that consumers uh, uh, are aware that the products that they're buying are from the farms that are using techniques that are low carbon agriculture. So that's a really interesting uh, uh, policy response for us to hear about. Thank you very much. So lastly, uh, we have Yi Chen Yi Shen um, Hua, the principal. Yi Chen Hua. 
Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. Um, uh, Principal Assistant uh, uh, Secretary from uh, Policies and Strategic Planning uh, Division, the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security from Malaysia. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ali. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, OECD, for inviting Malaysia as panelists. So uh, I will share uh, Malaysia experience towards policy making for our national agro-food policy 2021-2030. So uh, for information, Malaysia has identified five key challenges in our agro-food sector for the next 10 years. So uh, so we, we already identified few climate change can threaten agriculture practices in many ways, such, such as uh, increase in sea level, stress on water supply, fluctuation in peak temperature, changes in rainfalls, concentration, increased frequency and severity of natural disaster and, un and un unsustainable farming practices. So, uh, so the effect of climate change are increasingly being felt in recent years. So between uh, 2017 until 2021, a total of 40,000 hectares of paddy fields of our country paddy fields nationwide were destroyed by flood waters while another 9,000 hectares were damaged due to drought. So uh, for Malaysia, we, um, we give a kind of assistance, yeah? uh, assistance provided by our ministry uh, to target groups that are affected by disaster, which are the Agro-Food Project Redevelopment Program and the Rice Crop Disaster Fund. So in year two, 2000, 2022, about 43 million have been distributed to the affected farmers because of uh, uh, affected by natural disasters. So, okay, uh, based on Malaysia third by national by national communication and second biennial update reports, about 80%, 18% of uh, 350,000 hectares of paddy field are exposed to drought involving the east coast of peninsula Malaysia. So, and about 26% of rice cult cultivation uh, in Malaysia is predicted to be affected by flood waters in 2030. So the rising temperatures eventually would impact the yield of crops with a vast prolif proliferation of weeds and pests. Broad too will bring about crop failures and loss of arable lands. So uh, for uh, so we in in Malaysia we uh, have two main policies uh, related to agro food which is uh, National Agro-Food Policies 2.0 and National Food Security Policy Action Plan 2021 to 2025, which echoes the directive of uh, our ministry to uphold food security well. So National Agro-Food Policy 2.0 will be the driver of Malaysia economy, social and sustainable environment aspiration for the next decade in agro-food sector, Adopting the UNDP's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, uh, missions will be implemented for the vast strategies under National Food Security Policy Action Plan. So uh, we have three key characteristics of sustainability, resilience, and technological advancement. Uh, the Malaysia agro-food industry aspires to be one that is robust and agile, not only to keep pace with global economic growth, and the effects of globalization, but also to mitigate the impact of climate change. So a little bit about uh, adaptation of climate change in our paddy sector. So for example, when we talk about paddy sectors, more adaptation measures will be continuously done to overcome these climate change scenarios, such as the, we, uh, the, under our Malaysia Agriculture Research Center, uh, we developed um, uh, use of flood resistant, drought resistant varieties, uh, seeds for, for, for paddies in the event of any impact of seawater overflowing into rice growing areas, such as the, the seeds variety MR297 rice variety, can potentially be grown in minimal water condition, while the MRQ76 variety has drought resistant characteristics. So, in this case, we, we developed. Uh, uh, these two types of seeds, which can uh, can can resist uh, resist on, on flood and, and drought resistance. Okay, and then also we uh, uh, for application of irrigation technology infrastructures such as alternate wetting and drying, uh, 
uh, rain water harvesting and tube wells to optimize water use to improve the efficiency of irrigation infrastructure. The use of agricultural rainfalls index map and soil map to determine the suitability of crops in an area involved with the microclimate based on wet and dry months, as well as planning drainage and irrigation system. And also improve rice planting methods um, based on guidance for managing rice crops according to the set targets or with permission from rice check system. And also we also introduce agricultural insurance to reduce the risk of losses involving disaster due to the effects of climate change. So all these things is in our pipeline uh, to, to, uh, to cater for, for adaptation of climate change in paddy sector. So uh, I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much from those, for those insights from Malaysia, in particular, uh, the explanation of uh, the approaches of using seed varieties uh, for rice uh, that are flood and drought resistant. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, uh, use of technology and innovation, of course, and particularly of uh, relevance and interest to uh, Asia Pacific countries. Um, also, you mentioned the use of and of the policy of agricultural insurance uh, for um, uh, farmers in in response to the natural uh, natural disasters, which are more and more frequent. So, very interesting. Um, that's the end of our interventions from our um, our experts from uh, from the region. And now that we, now we have some time, we have about um, twenty minutes for uh, question and answers. Um, I have some questions come through through the chat, and uh, and I will uh, let um, I'll direct them to to some of our panelists, but also um, encourage the rest of our panel to uh, uh, intervene as well with their uh, view on on the question. Um, Please keep your responses uh, to about two minutes concise uh, so we can hear from several of you and get through some of these questions. So the first question that I have is, um, what advice uh, would you give to governments considering uh, uh, support to boost local production to improve food self-sufficiency and reducing reliance on imports uh, with a view to insulating against future supply shocks. I'm going to pass that question to Martin first off to have a go at responding to, and then open it up to the rest of our experts uh, for their views on, on that, given that we are, with, we are fortunate enough to be with uh, policymakers from the region. So thanks a lot. Martin, over to you. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you very much. And really a, a very, very good and very pertinent question. Thank you for that. Uh, let me let me maybe go make, make three points in response to that. One is uh, related to the fact that that has been mentioned a couple of times today already, that supply shocks obviously not only happen at the international level, they very much uh, will happen also at the national level. And uh, Southeast Asia in particular is increasingly um, you know, at risk uh, of being affected uh, to by by climate related uh, shocks. So I think insulating um, the domestic market from the international market system is counter or maybe counterproductive from that perspective because many of the shocks that you will need to deal with are likely to happen actually within your country or within the region. So um, the, the other reason why I think this insulation is, 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 a, is a dangerous vehicle, if you like, is that obviously it does increase uh, the, the food costs for your own consumers. So when you're concerned about food security of your population, uh, you will want to think about, uh, about that. Um, the, the second point I want to make in this context really is that the, 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 the single most efficient way of, of boosting production is uh, clearly uh, the route of, through innovation and uh, getting towards sustainable productivity growth. And that's not just about 
research and development. And we've heard a couple of really nice examples about what kind of new technologies, what new new methods uh, can, can be developed there. But it's, it's very importantly also about uh, getting those new technologies, getting those new uh, methods um, to the ground uh, through extension services, uh, through outreach, through cooperation, and also through technical uh, transfers. Um, so there, there is a need for international collaboration in that context as well. And the third point I really want to quickly make is, is related to risk management, because we've talked so much about these kinds of shocks, and obviously um, farmers will need to have a means to respond to shocks and to, to be able to cope with them. And so governments are really in, uh, in, in the spotlight here to make sure that farmers can do that. One is, obviously, there's the normal market risks that farmers can deal with them theirself, themselves, but there's also the need to develop market mechanisms to actually make this kind of insurance packages that we just heard about from Malaysia. Um, and then thirdly, there's also the need for governments to step in when there's really these kind of large scale events, like big floods, uh, where, where obviously market uh, instruments will no longer be able to actually handle those big events. And in those cases, it's quite important that governments come in. But I would really encourage others maybe to come, come, come into that question as well, because I think this is a is a key question. Thank you. Thanks so much, Martin, for those insights. Um, I'll just reread the question so you uh, have the opportunity to consider it again. Uh, what, so the question is, what advice would you give to governments considering support to boost local production to improve self-sufficiency, reducing reliance on imports with a view to insulating against future supply shocks? So, um, James, I see your hand up. Over to you, please. Just chomping at a bit to answer. I think what's really important here is uh, global food supply and that pool of global food supply. Um, it, it's a fact that world output is much less volatile. So world production is much less volatile than output in individual countries. And you know, countless research from you know, reputable international organizations like OECD um, and IFPRI and, and the like, FAO, um, and some um, academic researchers demonstrates this. So um, food production can be volatile. You know, it's affected by climate disasters, water availability, conflict, um, pest outbreaks, disease outbreaks, and that can lead to this volatility in food supply and food prices. So um, you know, Will Martin from IFPRI and Joe Glauber, formerly of the USDA, but also at uh, IFPRI, they, they've discussed this at length. They've examined different government policy responses to price volatility. Um, others have looked at this. Um, I'll take, for example, um, some, some researchers. They had a look at um, regions in India. And, you know, you can think of one country as multiple regions and trade across those regions. Again, it's very important. Trade across those regions, the states in India, um, reduced the incidence of famine. So that was from Burgess and Donaldson in 2010. Now, at an, a, a regional level, there was analysis undertaken by, in fact, the OECD in, in 2017. And that found that integration, in other words, free, more open trade in ASEAN rice markets, that could reduce uh, the undernourished population of those modelled countries by 5%. Um, and so as put by others, I mean, world output's much less volatile than output in individual countries. So to answer the question directly, you know, it's openness to trade is actually um, what reduces the um, exposure to supply shocks. Now, uh, Brooks and Matthews, also from the OECD, they, they demonstrated allowing access to international markets. Um, you know, that, that um, <laughs> generally led to more stable supply than depending solely on the domestic production. And this has also been found in you know, other OECD work, but also a um, paper by, by uh, Chow and Thorpe and Fell, 2021, um, pretty recent, that found that just in general, in terms of a domestic economy, protecting the domestic economy, it was expensive, it lowered incomes, um, it didn't significantly reduce volatility, it didn't reduce supply shocks anyway. Um, so it just demonstrates the kind of, um, putting up barriers doesn't really stabilize or insulate you against future shocks. So I'll just put that into another light. Imagine um, you, a country does put up protectionist barriers. Um, they're still exposed uh, to um, uh, 
other volatility. So a country could be so-called self-sufficient, but they still got to import fertilizer, machinery, other inputs that are necessary for production, um, still exposed to exchange rates, uh, energy prices, and other supply chain disruptions. And it's a fact that all countries, so we calculated this just last year, all countries that achieve high rates of self-sufficiency, they actually utilize imported inputs. So if that self-sufficiency has been achieved by putting up protectionist barriers and increasing prices for the consumers, um, and, and you know, increasing prices for the most vulnerable, um, it's not a very good policy at all. Um, now, if you've got to um, import the inputs to food, why not just import the food anyway? Um, so I, I think I can um, kind of um, largely wrap up there. Generally, you know, uh, self-sufficiency policies are introduced with good intentions, um, but by and large, they neglect the point that global food supply, whilst it could rightly appear to be, you know, volatile, um, it is, um, as countless studies and research has shown, it's far less volatile uh, than a localised food supply. Thanks so much, James, for that intervention. And also you listed a lot of um, references, including a lot of OECD reports. So you've made a, a very good publicity for us in your intervention. Um, now I'll pass the floor over to Sigi Fumi from uh, Japan for his uh, views on the topic, on the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very briefly. Um, Yes, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine has exposed the vulnerability of the global supply chain. And uh, we think that uh, uh, sustainable and uh, efficient use of the available regional resources in each country and each region contribute to the strengthening food security, not only the country, but also around the world. Um, ASEAN countries are now promoting the circular economy, uh, circular agriculture, and Japan is also. Um, especially in Japan, uh, securing the stable supply of the chemical fertilizer, uh, which depends on the import, is a major issue. And now, uh, many rural areas in Japan are working to promote uh, uh, sustainable and uh, resource recycling agriculture, uh, including the composting livestock waste and uh, recovering fertilizer ingredients from sewage slug and uh, property applying the uh, fertilizer based on the soil diagnostics. So which contribute to the resilience of the local supply chains? And at the same time, of course, the uh, rule-based and open trading system is also important for global food security. But um, we should continue to the effort to the stress in the resilience of the local and national and global supply chain based on the, uh, each country's uh, resources. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much. A really good point about the resilience of the supply chain um, and the importance of that. Um, Talim, uh, you had some uh, comments on this question too for us yes. to hear from. Yes, just um, briefly. Um, yeah, I would like to speak on um, other elements, not really focusing on food sufficiency. If we see how is the agriculture moving within ASEAN country? It's very clear that um, the share of high-value commodities increased very significantly, including in Indonesia. So um, keeping food sustainable and efficient food production is very important, but we have to also, uh, you know, keep in mind in promoting new trend in promoting high value commodities so that the uh, you know, has has contribution to the uh, increase household income in the rural areas and also uh, reducing uh, poverty that's my point thank you Right, that's a very important point in terms of uh, farm income and, and poverty, um, and of course food self uh, food um, security. 
Uh, Lev, uh, you'd like to make some comments on this question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Ellie. Uh, I agree with uh, the previous uh, panelists and speakers uh, who answered the questions. Uh, the question, um, well, uh, concisely and uh, straight to the point. Uh, if I would just like to add, um, I think uh, the government should also not on, only focus on uh, making production uh, uh, efficient, but also the whole value chain to be efficient. Uh, it's it's not just uh, on um, well, uh, based on the studies presented a while ago, it's not just focusing on on keeping the inputs uh, the cost of inputs uh, low but really to innovate uh, and uh, through research and development uh, to innovate new ways of, uh, of, of uh, producing, consuming, packaging and marketing, uh, marketing uh, agricultural and food products uh, so that it can be um, sustainably um, uh, consumed and produced by, 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 by the industry. And in addition, um, based on... Um, based on um, what I've heard uh, Ellie said a while ago about the diet shift. I think it is also important to really uh, introduce uh, other, other sources of nutrition from the traditional, like for example, in the Philippines, uh, we are uh, heavily consuming rice and other, other food are, are just snacks for us. It's not a complete meal without rice. But we know that the sector is vulnerable. Producing rice uh, uh, is really uh, uh, vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, and at the same time, it uh, it also contributes to uh, climate change impact. So, uh, what we're trying to do is to make uh, production of rice efficient. The introduction of alternate wetting and drying, uh, uh, introduction of varieties that uh, are high yielding, uh, with less uh, cost to 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 fertilize and to irrigate and of course to to introduce other root crops as staple like like sweet potato uh, that are that are uh, uh, less vulnerable to the impacts of climate change so so food security alone is not just uh, a policy for production and uh, production and the marketing and processing but also for consumption so trying to uh, also trying to influence the diet of, 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 of the consumers into a more uh, nutritious and balanced diet can also help in, in addressing food security risks and the food security shocks. So thank you. Thank you so much for those um, insights. And I uh, liked your comment that it's not a meal without rice. And, um, and yes, the need for uh, dietary change um, uh, so um, James, you want to have another go at this? And then we've got one other question and then we'll be uh, winding um, the webinar down. Thanks. Yeah, just very quickly with, with your indulgence, I just wanted to, I guess, focus on an underlying motivation here, an underlying policy motivation. You know, we talk about tariffs, we talk about subsidies, but these are kind of secondary. What's the policy motivation here? And in, in one case, it can be food security. And I don't think we've really talk about what is food security, right? Um, we've talked about self-sufficiency, for example, but that's a very different concept to food security. Um, you can think of food security, you know, using, for example, a UN Food and Agriculture Organization definition, um, for example, um, and that, that would cover um, availability of food, access to foods, so that's physical access and financial slash economic access, stability of food supply, and then something called utilization, which really is about nutrition and sanitation. And more recently, we, we tend to also think of food supply with two more, and that's agency. So, you know, an individual's ability to um, make decisions in markets, for example, and things like that's tied in with things like human rights. Um, but also um, sustainability. That's really important. Um, and so generally in these discussions, you know, we're focusing on we need to focus on things like um, not just availability, you know, supply of food but also the access to food. So the price that consumers face and also the incomes that they have to purchase food. They're just important policy considerations.
Thanks so much, James, for those insights and um, OECD at the OECD and the food systems team. We are doing a lot of work at the moment on um, food and security, which even uh, as we know, OECD uh, countries, their populations, there are food insecure um, uh, population, parts of the population, and OECD governments uh, have very little information about those um, populations. So um, this is a, an interesting topic for us uh, at the moment. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Gibran one other question um, that has come in, and it says, you know, thanks for the nice ideas. We're interested on how the ideas can be translated into actions. Mitigation in agriculture is required, but the small farmers need support. Who's going to pay for this? Gibran, who's going to pay for support that small farmers need to um, uh, change uh, and uh, to create uh, climate mitigation? Thanks. Thanks for the question. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, I just want to make a couple of points. Firstly, we know that there's large variation in greenhouse gas emissions across different food products. So we know that livestock products such as beef and dairy emit substantially more uh, than crops and other plant-based food products on a per kilogram or per calorie basis. But it's also important to note that there's significant variability of emissions within individual food products based, for instance, on the type of production systems. So that's the first point, that there's scope to mitigate emissions by using existing technologies to reduce emissions and to move towards more efficient and climate smart uh, production systems. The second point is that we recognise that reforms to agricultural support or, for instance, measures to put a price on emissions can have uh, negative impacts on food prices or on farmers' incomes. But uh, it's important to note that in many countries, support is provided in ways that are inefficient in transferring income to farmers and tend to be inequitable as they're not targeted to producers um, with low incomes. So transitional assistance and extended social safety nets may be required for poorer farm and other households to offset income losses from the removal of, of support um, or the higher food costs associated uh, with the removal of negative price support, for example. But this requires better information on the incomes and assets of farm households. Um, and also another point is that savings from the reforms of poorly targeted support can also generate significant additional funds for investments in public goods. And that leads me to a third point, which is that boosting investments in these public goods, such as R&D and innovation, can help to improve agricultural productivity, resulting in a win-win situation where production can increase or be maintained while emission intensities decline. So we need to ask, you know, what are the production technologies that can help to reduce emissions without compromising on yields and on productivity. So, for example, some speakers referred to alternate wetting and drying as a means to reduce uh, methane emissions from rice production. Uh, so those are a few, few ideas from me. Thanks so much, Gibran. Um, Hakyan, you want to make a brief intervention on this from a career uh, standpoint? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So question. I, I am curious about uh, Dr. Gibran's presentation. I am um, to see uh, uh, about the uh, uh, potential, the economic potential and the technical potential. So between uh, two kinds of potential you proposed. So I'm curious about the definition of two kinds of yeah, potential. Thanks, Gibran. Do you want to respond there? Sure. Um, so those numbers actually uh, came from the latest IPCC report. So the technical potential refers to, you know, what is uh, technically possible using existing uh, technologies, while the economic potentials are less than the technical potentials, but they refer to uh, the abatement potential uh, at less than 100 US dollars per tonne of CO2 equivalent. 
Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Right, so we're coming to the end of our um, webinar. I'll hand the floor over to uh, Leanne Jackson, who is the head of the Agri-Food uh, Agri Trade and Markets Division at the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate to close the webinar. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ellie. Um, and thanks to all the participants and panelists um, for this really uh, very interesting and robust discussion on the issues in front of us. Um, I'll just say a couple words in summary of some of the messaging um, that came through at the start of the start of the webinar, and then a bit of forward looking before we wrap it up. So just a few remarks. Um, in terms of challenges, we heard that Asia and Pacific region is responsible for half of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions and that agriculture land use and land use changes are causing more than a fifth of those emissions so it's a big issue we can all see that um, and at the same time agriculture in general and southeast asia and the pacific in particular are strongly exposed to climate change um, to the threats that 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 those it, effects those climate change effects pose for their agriculture sectors and that the impacts on agriculture are going to have or have the potential to have large effects on food security and livelihoods also. So it's a complex package of challenges um, and it's going to require um, complex solutions in some cases. Um, since agriculture is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, the sector needs to be able to adapt but it can also really play an important role in climate change mitigation and fostering carbon sequestration. So we've heard some ideas around um, policy packages that can help um, move agriculture into a constructive role in helping with transforming um, agricultural and food systems to support climate mitigation. And as the ADB has put it in their report, agriculture is one of the critical sectors in climate change solutions. So we've also heard a lot about what governments are doing in this area. Um, analysis from OECD and ABARES and others have shown that support provided by governments to the sector um, is often uh, not only inefficient in helping farmers' livelihoods, but it also has the strong potential to distort markets um, and create frictions in terms of having the sector being able to adapt um, to shocks that come through the system. So we had a nice question about this uh, and a little bit of a round of exchange on the question of resilience as well. Um, Abair's work, which I found really interesting, suggests that we need to think about a full reform of agricultural support. So not just um, uh, support, domestic support to farmers, but also thinking about tariff reforms and market access reforms, because a package of reforms can actually lead to more positive outcomes <laughs> across the triple challenge. So it's really important to think about a full set of reforms. Um, and we heard from OECD and the ADB that beyond reforming agricultural support, there's many different areas where efforts can help. So um, pricing emissions has been seen as an efficient way of curbing emissions, but you need to think about the food price effects. There's also um, efforts that government, governments can make in terms of paying for long-term and provable sequestration um, practices. Uh, we know the transformation is gonna require policy reforms. There's no one size fits all. Um, we need to keep talking and sharing the different solutions across um, experiences to, to come to good global solutions. So just a couple words about forward looking. Um, at the OECD, we had an OECD Ag Ministerial meeting last year. We've heard references to that through this webinar. Sp ministers were really thinking about forward looking solutions for the sector, how the sector can contribute to transformative solutions, including with respect to um, contributing to solutions for climate change. So some specific um, language from the, from the declaration that came through, ministers committed to increasing climate change mitigation efforts by reducing emissions and also to effectively increase carbon sequestration. Um, they also committed uh, to intensify um, efforts to reform or reorient agricultural support. And again, this resonates with many of the um, themes that came up during this webinar so far. 
And um, importantly, they committed to support the development and implement implementation of science-based and evidence-based standards that will facilitate trade and ensure access to innovations. So we can see that the importance of making sure the whole system is working in order to get our solutions moving forward. We're working on developing research to help um, policymakers move forward on those commitments. So keep an eye out for what um, the OECD is going to be producing in the future. Then maybe one last word about food security. Of course, food security is another key element. We've heard lots of um, um, comments on that topic, um, really robust discussion on it. Um, the OECD is engaged um, with the Southeast, a with Southeast Asian region, um, including its work on food systems and food security and nutrition, and is collaborating with the ASEAN Secretariat and officials from ASEAN countries to have a webinar um, later this year, um, next month in February, which will have a look at identifying priorities and key challenges related to food security. Um, and then just my final words, um, a few people mentioned the importance of um, cooperation and linking with different stakeholders within the system, also dialogue um, and collaboration. I think this webinar um, is one example of a way we can all share, share practices across countries, um, share information and evidence that is coming in through international organizations and through this kind of dialogue, hopefully we move towards a world that can start addressing these big climate challenges. So Ellie, that's it for me. Um, back to you in case you have any last wrap up. Thank you very much, Leanne. Um, thank you to all our um, uh, participants uh, for this uh, really engaging conversation. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in to watch us on uh, the YouTube uh, live stream and uh, the Zoom. And I wish you all a pleasant evening or day. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.